Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and a couple months ago I journeyed to Japan for about three weeks on a work-related assignment. While I was there I took a whole bunch of samples, toured the, the countryside, saw everything. Um, I'm going to show you a few of the samples I took, I have way too many to go through all of them. Um, I was expecting to find huge amounts of cesium-137 all over the place. You know, just put my detector right up against the street corner and there it would be. The reality is I actually saw almost none. In fact, I only found one valid detection of it while I was there. Uh, the reason for this is because I was in the Yamaguchi Prefecture, which is in the very bottom uh, of uh, Japan. It's both south and west of Fukushima by quite a significant distance. And so I'm pretty sure that area seems to have been left largely unaffected. I happen to know for a fact that areas above Tokyo did receive plenty of, uh, of fallout from Fukushima. In fact, I've tested samples from those areas. So let me show you some of the stuff I found. I brought with me this field portable spectrometer, the Polymaster 1703 MO1B, which is good for detecting and identifying nucleides, sometimes mistakenly called isotopes as well as a Geiger counter. This was my quarry. This is cesium-137 and cesium-134 from a Japanese sample I tested a year ago. As I journeyed through the countryside, I went through all of these beautiful places, just one after the other. It was kind of hard to suspect that any of it could even be contaminated with how beautiful it looks, but of course the way it looks has zero to do with what's actually there. And I tested each one of these locations as I went through them, uh, when I could, people are somewhat suspicious of people testing things, and a lot of these places are sacred too, so you're not supposed to really test in sacred places. But you can act like a tourist if you like, as you can see here I am being a consummate American tourist. The funnest part was going through all the shops and stores. Here's an example of me in the grocery store. These are really hard to test in because they have cameras, security, and it's not that they're so much against testing, it's just when you start pocketing things, kind of like pulling little items in and out of your, your pocket. You look like a shoplifter. There, look. And if you wander around blatantly with the detector, then you're just going to have every single person come up to you and ask you what you're doing and cause one trouble after another. Oh, I tried all kinds of techniques. In the end, uh, it actually was tremendously harder to test, especially in places like this, than you might suspect. But whenever I did test, I never was able to find any CC-137. In fact, the only place I actually found any was ironically on the ground in Yamaguchi Prefecture underneath a tree. I actually sat there eating my lunch for a half an hour doing a test with my polymaster. So um, now that I've gotten done showing you all of this, let me show you the method I used and I'll show you some of the results. And then, eh, that should be about the end. Oh, one more thing. I also tested one really weird thing while I was there. There was a, there was a bar I went into and the bar had a snake in a jar full of sake. And apparently this is something people like to drink in Japan. Well, I kept away from snakes in jars because I thought the idea of putting a snake in a jar was pretty despicable, personally. But anyway, what I did test was my food. As you can see, here's some of my super tasty food. And I tested every single piece of it that I ate just to be sure. Um, by the way, the techniques I used are based on Dr. Gilbert Gilmore's book. Here's the book right here, Practical Gamma Ray Spectrometry. And I used my TI-89 Titanium, it's keyboard, and of course I used my computer with some programs I made to test this. Let me show you the equations and the spectra. Okay, so let me just give you a quick idea of what a sample looks like before we go and look at the Japanese ones. This one is from Oregon, just to give you a quick idea. This side right here, le the left side, the y-axis if you like, are counts. One, two, three, four, and all the way up to whatever. And each one of these little guys here, the x-axis, are channels. These channels, uh, whenever a photon is detected by a detector, uh, it's dropped in one of these channels based on its energy from low energy over on this side, the, the left, moving to high energy on the right. And so these channels build up and you end up seeing patterns like, for example, this lead 214 uh, peak starts to form right here. And so just that's a good uh, example, I guess, of how um, spectrometers show data. And by the way, you see there's a whole mess of stuff in just regular spectra that you, t you take from regular soil. I mean, just, just seeing regular soil, for example, you will see, you see it right here, just looking at the, the background and everything, there'll be lots and lots of uh, peaks and little 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 um, indentations and things sticking up here. 
And just because you see them doesn't mean that you have, you know, Chernobyl or Fukushima or whatever. Um, each one needs to be regarded for what it actually is. Sometimes they're, nor they're natural, sometimes they're man-made. Um, and a really significantly powerful detector, one could even detect um, uh, fallout from Chernobyl and from uh, weapons testing and so on. Those are still in the actual atmosphere and can still be detected, and of course Fukushima too. So let's move forward here. Uh, this is the technique I use. I uh, used a TI-89 titanium calculator with a keyboard to come up with this. This equation right here is a very simplified version of what's used by a lot of um, physicists. I kind of uh, uh, made a few things a little easier here since I was working with a really basic type of peak that I was trying to detect. Nothing particularly complicated. <clears throat> so basically put... Um, what I'm doing here is I'm seeing that this is where the background is. The spectrum, you know, is going up and down and up and down. I remember the spectrum you just looked at a second ago. See this kind of up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm taking like an area right here and seeing if it's a detection. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this side. I'm going to look at this side. I'm going to kind of calculate where the background should be if this were not here. Does that make sense? And then whatever's above that should be a valid detection. So let's go back and look at the math. Um, the background continues here. And then it, and it goes all the way through here. We can be 95% confident with this little bit of padding that we put in here that everything that is above the padding is a true detection. Some of these are going to be true, and some of, the, some of them are going to be false because the background never is you know flat. It kind of bounces around. But mathematically, and that's the whole point of this. Uh, in fact, specifically that number right there is calculating how much of this is a detection statistically um, uh, being greater than a 95% confidence. And so that's pretty much how we do it. Uh, if anybody sees anything wrong with the math, you could always feel free to scream. Just in case anybody is looking at the math, S is the set of all of these numbers from here to here. That's the region of interest plus the little chunks of background on each side. That's what S is standing for. So that's S sub sub variable. And it's usually 20, 30 slots uh, or elements wide. And in case you're looking, uh, m is the other variable. m is the width of the of the side that we're using to calculate background. And in this case, I use six for most of my samples, six channels, six and six. That right there is what figures out the rest of this for anybody who's looking at the math. Uh, Ks and Js and stuff are just iterative variables. So let's get away from the math now. And let's look up. Um, I actually use my computer, too. Here's an example of me using the computer to calculate the same basic thing. I put in all the channels, I get all the data here, derivatives and everything like that, and I end up with the back, I end up with the actual sample and some little things I was working on over here. So um, let's look at a couple samples. This is soil from an undisclosed location. Why is it undisclosed? Because honestly, I took a lot of these samples in places where I probably, you know, I mean, they weren't illegal, bad, or wrong, but you know, you're walking by somebody's house and you put your detector down and let it get a sample going and you're sitting there tying your shoe or checking your cell phone and while you're actually doing a spectrum, it's not nice, but you, you have to be careful because you're trying to, like, take uh, spectra without getting pounced on. Because I had been hearing all these rumors about the police going after people. I never saw any of that, by the way. In fact, I went past many police. I went through security at airports, showed them my detectors completely out in the open, not hidden in my bag, just out in the open. I had no problems whatsoever. But I kept worrying about it, worrying about it. So I, I you know, I, I, I tried to keep it on the DL. So we're going to call this place un, undisclosed. And this is from uh, Yamaguchi uh, pre Prefecture again. And as you can see, there's no cesium-137 detected in this little area. You could try to say that this bump is cesium-137, but I mean, look at the rest of them. It is not statistically valid that it is. Maybe, but it's not in such a way that we can call it valid. Moving forward, uh, this is a statistically valid peak we found. Look at this giant potassium one right here. Potassium's everywhere, but that, that's natural. Um, and look at that, that right there is um, that right there is from uranium. So <laughs> uranium is pretty pronounced as well. This is a CC-137 peak, I believe. It was statistically uh, valid when I tested it, being, a, being that I can say that there's a 95% confidence that the detections I got were above background. And as you can see, if you look at it, these guys here, for the most part, tend to kind of flow at a nice angle going down, the little end pieces, the change in them and everything like that. Um, this little piece here does not. I mean, I guess that's one visual way to look at it. That's certainly not how I detected that it was what it what it was. I used uh, math to do it, but you can see it doesn't really stand out. If this were a heavily contaminated area, you'd see a peak like this, 
be a big peak right here, big, big, big one right there in a Compton Edge and all this other stuff, and you don't see it because it's incredibly trace. So uh, let's look for a second and see just how trace it is. Here are some um, uh, uh, numbers that I pulled out. Hotel, rainwater drain, ropeway, which is a gondola, under the tree, melon candies. Oh, God, the melon candies are so good. And see the negative number? That means there was no detection made. Beautiful. Um, the place where I got the detection was here, under a tree. I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. But that was on uh, was that April, May. So that was May 29th I tested that. And I got a total of 18.39 detections in about a half of an hour. 1,851 seconds, not quite a half hour, it's a little over a half hour. 18 detections in that period of time, that means tick, 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 I get 18 of those in 30 minutes. That's not very much. Even scaling up for inefficiencies, for pyre geometry and all that sort of stuff, you're looking at a few becquerels per kilogram at the very, very most. Uh, my unit is able to automatically detect around 160 plus or minus becquerels per kilogram. If you remember my how low can it go paper, I actually showed all the math of how I figured that out. Um, so this is way below that, and that that's and that that number in itself is way below the food safety limits. And of course, this was soil, and I'm not planning on eating soil. Um, and I actually don't know if it was from Fukushima. For all I know, it could be from weapons testing, but it's not man-made. That's for sure. CC-137 either came from a nuke or a reactor or one of the other. Um, so here it is, my one valid detection. Now, the reason that I didn't get very many detections when I was in Japan is really, really simple, and I'll explain it in the, in, in the very end of the video in just a second. It's actually pretty straightforward, but before I do it, let me show you Chiba and Fukushima. <laughs> uh, let's see. I did test Chiba, but I was on a bus. I couldn't get out of the bus, so I had to test it as I went by. The math says that that is not a CZ-137 detection. I don't know. It looks surprisingly good enough to be one, but it, you know the math does show that it is not, so you can kind of decide whether you think it is or think it isn't. Chiba is well known for having contamination from Fukushima. If I were to put a detector on the ground in Chiba in various locations, I could get quite a good reading off of it, so that, that's already been well documented, so that could be. It's hard to say. Um, I did fly over Fukushima, which I think is absolutely hysterical. Actually, they flew the air, airplane over Fukushima, and that's about 50 miles west, um, so kind of southwest. So the likelihood of actually picking it up is basically zero, but I figured, you know, why not run a quick spectrum? This was, spectrum was only for a couple of minutes because the airplane flies over pretty quickly. And you can see there's nothing really there, nothing that stands out uh, any higher than the rest. Um, oops, we'll get back to the beginning again. So um, there's cosmic background. So let me discuss now why it's kind of obvious that I didn't find very much now that I look back on it. In the end, we all know that there's fallout in Fukushima. There's basically no point denying it. Samples that I've seen, samples tested from above uh, Tokyo show significant amounts of Fukushima fallout. It's in street corners, it's in parks, it's all over the place. Uh, thousands of trash bags line, line fields near Fukushima as they clear out the topsoil. The reason I didn't detect much of anything is because I was in the extreme southwest of uh, Japan. I was south of, to of uh, Hiroshima for most of the point, uh, most of the trip. And that simply explains why I didn't find very much. It wasn't in my food, it wasn't in my water, it wasn't on the ground for the most part. So lucky for me and lucky for the people that live in the south. And to the Japanese people who were very nice and accommodating me as I came to Japan, looked around, and generally did all the weird things that I do, um, arigato gozaimashita, uh, sayonara.